I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and a voice I hear calling on my ear within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known searching for things that could not satisfy and then I heard my Savior calling draw from my well that never shall run dry fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord come and Quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. So, my brothers, if the things this world gave me. Lord will come and heal you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me Good morning. Most of you are probably seeing this on Palm Sunday morning, April 5th, 2020. Uh, I want to share a few announcements with you this morning for our church family. Uh, one is I want to offer a word of thanks for those of you who have so faithfully been supporting and uh, continuing to lift up the church. Uh, I'm impressed as I pick up the mail each day at the number of folks who are faithfully sending in their tithes and their offerings to help support and continue our ministries. 
Uh, you may not seem like we're doing much at this point. We're not holding our regular services. We're not able to gather because of restrictions. But there are a number of things that we have been able to do. Uh, as you know, we want to thank John Parkinson, who's been working with us so that we could record and place these sermons up online for, for you to listen to. Uh, we'll have some additional entrees to the menu uh, today that you'll be able to hear. Also, let me just share that uh, thanks to the help of several of our folks, uh, for John and for Jack Graham and Kurt and Pam Stubbs and a couple others that helped out, we were able to make some deliveries to about 25 households in our church family of seniors and some of our older members, uh, for some dropping off food, dropping off some newsletter, uh, devotional booklets and things that were needed. Uh, so we are continuing to seek to serve in whatever ways we can. Additionally, we are planning this Tuesday, April 7th, from noon to 6, we are hosting a blood drive. We know that there are all the limitations about crowds and going out and gathering together, but there's also a crucial need for blood. So on Tuesday from noon to 6, we will be hosting in our fellowship hall a blood drive with an organization called Vitalant. If you want to consider donating blood, you need to schedule before coming in. And the simplest way to do that is you can call them at their toll-free number, 877-258-4825, or you can visit their website at vitalant.org. You'll see posted on our website a copy of the flyer about this blood drive, but we encourage you to, to help out if you're able as we seek to provide the gift of life through donating blood. Also, we have prayer concerns. We want to continue to lift up uh, our nation's leaders as well as leaders around the world. We want to continue to lift up the leaders in our church, our health care providers, doctors, nurses, those who are seeking to be on the front lines and helping in this difficult time. Also remember those emergency personnel, police, firefighters, paramedics who are working. Hold them in your prayers. Also, we want to invite you to remember and lift up in prayer one mem a member of our church family who's experienced the loss this past week. Many of you know Margie Schaefer. Her husband, Robert Lynn Schaefer, passed away suddenly on Friday. We want to hold this family in our prayers and lift them up in their grief. As we move forward from this point, I'd invite you to join with me as we pause for a moment of prayer. Gracious God, the world is changing in ways we never imagined possible. Every day there seems to be more news, more changes, more directives, more recommendations, more restrictions. We pray for wisdom and for strength for our leaders, both nationally, locally, and within the church. We pray for grace and mercy. We pray for your cover of protection for those who seek to help and to heal in the midst of this crisis. We pray for those who feel alone or discouraged or forgotten. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for those carrying the burden of concern for loved ones, friends, and neighbors. We pray for those who grieve. Hear our prayers and help us in this time to hear what you would say to us through your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Our scripture today is being read uh, by two local celebrities that we drafted. Uh, Luke and Landon Stack will be sharing the passage of scripture that leads into my sermon. We'll pause just a moment and hear the word of God. It's April 5th, 2020, Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, verse 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth page on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead, and you once will find a donkey tied there with a colt to her. Untie them and bring them to the Lord, needs them, and will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken throughout the prophet. Say to Zion, Zion, see your king come to gentle and riding on a donkey and a colt. The foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. 
A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asking, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in, in Goliath. I want to thank Landon and Luke for uh, doing such a fine job sharing with us the scriptures for today. For the first five years of our married life, my wife and I served two small rural churches in north central Ohio. The parsonage we lived in was located on Main Street in a small town. Main Street was an old state route that ran east and west through the center of town. Every year, the town would hold a parade. I believe it was in conjunction with the Firemen's Fourth of July Festival. The local police department would close off the street on either end of town, and we had front row seats in our front yard since we lived on Main Street. It wasn't a huge parade, but as small town parades go, it was pretty good. And it was convenient. We could grab our lawn chairs and head out in the front yard. For that matter, we could sit on our front porch and watch the parade and then head back to the house afterwards. No hunting for parking places or trying to find a place to sit. The mayor of the town was a member of my church. And after one of those parades, I was talking with him and a question came to my mind. I'm curious, I asked, who do you have to contact to get permission each year to close the road so you can have the parade. He smiled and looked at me and said, oh, you can't get permission. Since this is formerly a state route, you're not allowed to shut down the road for a parade. I asked him, well then, how do you get away with it? Well, he said, it's like this. We just go ahead and stop traffic on each end of town it's not a very big parade, it doesn't last very long, and our local police officers close off the road. The county sheriff department, the state patrol barracks are both about a half hour away. By the time anybody thinks enough to complain, by the time anybody bothers to call in their complaint, and by the time the sheriff or the state patrol are able to find an officer to drive all the way down here, well, by that time the parade's over and we've all gone home. I said, and that works? Well, he smiled, we've done it that way for years, and so far, we've managed to get away with it. So for the five years we lived in that little town, we, along with most of the town people, enjoyed watching the annual official but not quite legal parade. And as far as I know, it's still going on after all these years. Think of the parades you've participated in or witnessed over the years. Memorial Day, 4th of July, the annual Christmas parade, Thanksgiving Day parades in New York. Maybe you've gathered for parades welcoming home a winning team or returning troops or a famous person visiting the area. My hunch is that most of those parades were sanctioned. That is, the powers that be, be it the local government, town council, city officials, local police, granted their approval for the parade to take place. After all, parades can be kind of complicated. You have to del the delay that they cause from stopping traffic, the crowds, parking, safety, security, not to mention the cleanup of the mess left behind afterwards. And in today's world, you'd have to apply for a permit and get official permission to hold a parade. You'd often hear of spontaneous spur-of-the-moment parades. This morning, Christians around the globe Christians remember a spontaneous parade that occurred centuries ago on a street leading into Jerusalem. But this year, the celebration's a lot different than it's been most years. Normally, Christians around the world would gather in churches this morning or outdoor settings to remember the Palm Sunday parade when Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time. Normally, Catholics across the world would watch as the Pope would address thousands gathered across Vatican Square in Rome for Palm Sunday services. Normally, hundreds of thousands of Christians would parade many through the streets of Jerusalem waving palm branches 
and commemorating what's known as Christ's triumphal entry. But today, April 5th, 2020, churches across the U.S. and indeed across most of the globe sit empty. Today, Vatican Square in Rome is cleared of all people, and the Pope will broadcast his Sunday Mass far away from any crowds, alone from inside St. Peter's Basilica. Today, the city of Jerusalem is under lockdown, and armed soldiers patrol the streets to help enforce the stay-at-home orders. In fact, in most cities and towns across the globe, you would be hard-pressed to find a, cr a crowd, much less a parade, anywhere. And in fact, if you did, it's a pretty safe bet that authorities would be quick to disperse it and arrest or quarantine anyone who was part of it. On the day that we remember as Palm Sunday, Jesus meekly rode a young donkey down from the Mount of Olives and into the city of Jerusalem, accompanied by his disciples. The streets were crowded as devout Jewish pilgrims from all over were traveling to the city to celebrate Passover. We're not quite sure how it started, but it appears that as folks began to realize who Jesus was, they started to get excited. People began to shout. They, they pulled branches from the trees and waved them in the air. Some took off their cloaks and garments and laid them in the road before Jesus, sort of a red carpet welcome. And soon it appears many in the crowd joined together in hope that this might be the one who would finally deliver them from their oppressors. This might be the one to set things right. And soon those scattered crowds on a dusty road joined together in a parade of sorts. It wasn't government approved. In fact, the Roman authorities didn't allow such things. They didn't like large crowds gathering. They were afraid it might lead to a riot or worse, rebellion. The religious leaders who oversaw the affairs of the temple, who considered themselves to be in charge of the religious day-to-day -day events of the city, didn't sanction the parade. Many of them were, were not very fond of Jesus, highly suspect of him. And they were fearful that growing crowds and, and shouting groups such as this might lead to Roman intervention and possibly restrictions on their powers in the temple. But the impromptu parade went on nonetheless. I guess it isn't entirely correct to say the parade was unplanned. It would appear that God had planned for this day for some time. In the Old Testament book of Zechariah, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations, and his rule will extend from sea to sea. Now, I'm sure Jesus could have simply walked into the city, as he had no doubt done on numerous occasions before. But this day, as he got near Jerusalem, it seems he wanted to make a public statement about his fulfillment of the Scripture. In 165 B.C., nearly two centuries before the coming of Christ, a man by the name of Judas Maccabee, outnumbered 10 to 1, gathered people around him, and defeated Syrian troops who had invaded Israel. And when he entered Jerusalem, he rode a donkey to fulfill Zechariah's passage, so such history might help explain the events that occurred over 100 years later as Jesus rode in on a donkey. If you travel to Israel today, if you visit Jerusalem, they can show you the path they believe Jesus followed in the city that day. It begins up on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city and then winding down the hillside across the valley and through the city gate. We're told people spread their, their cloaks on the donkey to cushion Jesus' ride. Others laid their garments in the road. Mark tells us they spread branches they had cut from the fields and the trees. Words of his he Jesus' healings and teachings and miracles had spread throughout the region and in the busy roads leading Jerusalem, filled with pilgrims for the coming Passover, 
It didn't take long for word to spread that this man riding a young donkey was the one they had heard so much about. Most recently, he had healed blind Bartimaeus outside the city of Jericho. And according to John, he had just come from raising Lazarus from the dead. You can be assured that this kind of news spread quickly. As that young donkey carried Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, crowds grew more and more excited. They waved palm branches in the air, threw their garments in the road. They started to shout, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A quotation from the 118th Psalm, the 26th verse. It's one of those psalms pilgrims sang and recited as they neared Jerusalem. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Now there's a very political statement. Longing for the restoration of the Jewish throne. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The commotion grew so loud that in Luke 19 we're told some of the Pharisees asked Jesus to make the crowd quiet down. And Jesus responded, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the very stones themselves will cry out. In John's account, chapter 12, verse 19, he says the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they'd heard he performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Mark tells us that after Jesus entered the city, he visited the temple, and then he and his disciples withdrew to Bethany, quite possibly to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and spent the night. And the little parade was over. It had ended before the Roman soldiers garrisoned in Jerusalem could be sent out to investigate the disturbance, though they no doubt heard about it. But you and I know the story didn't end there. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem was, in a sense, a beginning of the end of his earthly mission. He was welcomed with shouts on Sunday, but by Friday there would be other crowds that gathered and shouted for his death. Crowds gathered to welcome him with expectation of deliverance from the Romans that Sunday, but by Friday crowds would line the streets, crying out for his execution as he carried his cross to Golgotha. Already on the day that we remember as Palm Sunday, the tide was beginning to turn against him, and before the week was out, he would be betrayed by a friend, abandoned by his disciples. He would be arrested, falsely accused, and convicted, scourged, beaten, mocked, and abused, and condemned to die on a cross. But on that Sunday, for just a few moments, people joined up in a triumphant welcome parade as he entered Jerusalem. Still today, people love a parade. Or at least we will, if and when life returns to some sort of normalcy and we're finally freed from things like stay-at-home orders. But the reality was, because of what lay in store for Jesus in the days ahead, after the Palm Sunday Parade. Life would never be the same again. That's really one of our fears today, isn't it? Will life ever be the same again? Traditionally, these past weeks of Lent for believers are usually a time of giving up some things and choosing to take up some others, spending more time on inner reflection, drawing apart from some of our regular routines to listen for God's whisper. We call this season Lent. This year, for all people of the Christian faith and otherwise, there have been many recommendations and restrictions on things that we should give up or must give up, gathering in crowds, going out to eat or the movies, going to sporting events. And there are recommendations or requirements, things we're asked to do, to take on social distancing, self-isolating, wearing gloves, even masks, if we do go out. The other day I saw that someone had posted a lie on, on the internet that I thought was particularly true. It said simply, this is the lentiest Lent I've ever Lented. 
How true for many of us. No parades today, no children roaming the aisles of churches, waving palm branches, no triumphant songs sing, rising from choirs and congregations. But we remember, and we know, that a day is coming when we will gather again, when we will come together in worship again, when we will lift our songs of praise together again, I invite each and every one of you to take some time today. Go outside, gather a small branch from a budding tree, bring it in your house and place it in some water as a symbol and reminder. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, they waved palm branches because that's what was available to them. Make use of what's available to you to remember Christ's entry into Jerusalem. And may that budding branch or limb bear witness to the hope of new life and growth. But also throughout this week, remember and reflect on what lay ahead for Jesus after Palm Sunday. You might spend this week reading, you might try reading from John chapter 12 through chapter 27 as a part of your daily reading to follow some of the events of Holy Week. And remember with Christians around the globe that the path that Jesus rode into Jerusalem would ultimately take him to a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, and death on the cross. Now, each Sunday in Lent, I've been following the theme, Windows to Our Faith, and highlighting one of the stained glass windows that helps to beautify our church facility. This Sunday, I'm fairly sure that the window I've chosen is probably not anyone's favorite. In fact, I'm reasonably sure that a number of you have probably never even noticed the window we're going to visit this week. Come with me for a moment. As you come in the main entrance doors of the church, you probably notice the window to your right that we focused on last week. That is the window of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, with the bright colors and the warm image of Christ holding a lamb in his arms. But on your left is a vastly different depiction. In fact, it is so strikingly different that some time ago a person visiting our church for the first time sought me out and asked me a question. They said, who's the creepy guy in the window when you come in the entrance? And sure enough, this window is not brightly colored. It's dark. It lets very little light through. The face of the individual isn't heavenly looking, nor is it radiant or even inviting. It's, it's dark. It's, it's shaded. It's it's a little creepy. Unlike most of the other stained glass windows in our building, there's some question about just who this character is supposed to be. Now, it's my understanding in most stained glass windows, in fact, in most artist depictions of biblical characters, there are clues within the picture as to who the character is. Now, this dark window, the only clue that I can find lies near the right hand of the character in the window. You probably can't even see it very well. But near his right hand, hanging from his belt, there are two keys. That would lead me to believe this shady, dark, somber-looking character is Simon Peter. And in fact, that's what many in the church feel. That's what we find when we look back through the records, that they think this is Simon Peter. And that's it. Remember Matthew 16, when Jesus, near the area of Caesarea Philippi, asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? It was Peter who spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Maybe this window is meant to depict Peter in darkness, remembering how Peter the rock ultimately crumbled 
and denied Christ. Not once, but three times on the night he was betrayed. And lest we judge Peter too harshly, we might also reflect on the times and situations where we have denied our Lord and Savior by our words, by our actions, by our silence, or our inaction, out of fear of peer pressure. There's an old hymn written by Charles Wesley in a hymnal entitled Depth of Mercy. I want to read those words for you. Depth of mercy can there be, mercy still reserved for me. Can my God his wrath forbear, me the chief of sinners spare? I have long withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face, would not hearken to his calls, grieved him by a thousand falls. I, my master, have denied, I afresh have crucified, oft profaned his hallowed name, put him to an open shame. There for me the Savior stands, shows his wounds and spreads his hands. God is love, I know, I feel. Jesus weeps and loves me still. If we're honest in our heart of hearts, we know that Peter was not so different from us. We have each in our own way at various times and moments denied through our words or actions the Lord we claim to serve. But like Peter, there is hope and redemption and a depth of mercy reserved for us. We can be forgiven, we can be restored, God can reclaim and cleanse and use us as we make our confession and offer ourselves in service to Him. If our stained glass window is a depiction of Simon Peter, it seems a sad remembrance to cover him so darkly, the one whom God used to help found His church. But remember I said there's some question as to just whom this window represents. While some assume it's Simon Peter, not in his greatest hour, recently someone from another faith tradition suggested another possibility. They pointed out the character in the window appears to be dark-skinned, possibly Ethiopian or African. What's more, they pointed out that there is a character mentioned in the events surrounding the crucifixion in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke's Gospel, who is traditionally depicted as one being of a dark-skinned race. His name is Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is on the North African coast in modern-day Libya. We only have one verse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that refers to him, and his role may seem a minor one in the events of Holy Week, but he did a service to our Lord and Savior that's recorded in three of the four Gospels. Matthew, as they were going out, they met a man, Simon of of a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Mark 15, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way and from the country, and they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Luke 23, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. When Jesus, tired and weakened from his ill treatment, stumbled and fell, trying to carry his cross through the city streets, we're told the soldiers commanded Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. They didn't ask him to do so. Simon didn't volunteer to do so. After all, who would ever volunteer to carry someone else's cross? Well, that's right. Only one. And his name was Jesus, and he carried mine, and he carried yours. I wonder if our dark, grim character in the window might not represent Simon of Cyrene, a man about whom we know little, but who under the older order of soldiers, even though unwillingly, had the honor of helping to bear the cross of Jesus. Years ago, I traveled to Cambridge, Ohio, with youth from a church I was serving, we made an annual event. In Cambridge, you'll find a place called the Living Word Outdoor Amphitheater. And each summer, through the summer months and the evenings, they have an outdoor drama or portrayal of the last days of Christ's life. There are numbers of people in the local area who serve as cast members. There's a reproduction of the streets of the city of Jerusalem. It's a very moving event. 
But for a number of years, we made the tradition that I would take a youth group and we would go, and one night we would attend the performance outdoors. It depicts the latter days of Christ's life, his death, and resurrection. And then the youth and I would camp out nearby. And we would come back the next night and we would serve as extras in the cast for the performance. It always intrigued me. The kids were okay with watching the performance, but when the next night when we came back, when they got to go backstage, when they got to mingle with all of the other actors, when they were outfitted in their costumes, some with beards and wearing all sorts of regalia to be, play characters, they were excited. Some of them got to play disciples at the Last Supper. Some of them got to play various other roles. One year I remember on that second night, as we were nearing the end of the drama production, just before we went out on into the production, one of the actors turned to me and said, we need someone to play Simon of Cyrene. Would you be willing to do it? Now I will confess, acting terrifies me. It makes me nervous. But on that night I agreed. And he said, all you have to do when we get out here in the crowd scene, one of the soldiers will point at you and will say, you there, carry his cross. And then you simply walk over and take the cross from the, sh from the shoulder of the man portraying Jesus and, and then follow the soldiers from there. Sounded easy enough. So when we were there in the crowd scene, it came to that moment where the soldier looked at me and said, you, carry his cross. And I walked over and there was the actor portraying Jesus half kneeling on the ground with a crown of thorns on his head, his clothing tattered, pressing under the weight of the cross. And as I knelt down to take the cross from him, he lifted it onto my shoulders and then he whispered in my ear so that only I could hear, my cross is heavy, but I'll help you to carry it. Those words touched me. I felt it was more than just an actor offering a cue. Friends, right now, for many of us, the burdens we are carrying, the concerns we have for friends and family and others is heavy, but we know that we don't bear the load alone. Christ walks with us. The cross is heavy, but Christ will help you carry it. I want to close with a passage from Philippians chapter 2 beginning with verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interest of others, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset that was in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. And taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the heaven, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.